thankful, guilty, thankful times two, loved, strong times two, mortal, grateful, too fat, Christian, baptized, forgiving, brave, friend, and growing. So can you see all of those words on Jesus? You know, we have a tendency to think of Jesus as this perfect entity that does nothing wrong. But I want you to stop and think about it, because as you go through the Bible, Jesus isn't always about sitting in the synagogue on temple time and not making any noise. At one point, he turns over all the tables. In last week's gospel, he called a woman whose child was dying or had a demon around her, called her a dog. He gets angry. And today, alone in the gospel, three times, the word that is translated into our English slang, shut up, is used three times. It's the same word that's used when the big storm is coming and the disciples are afraid because of all of the wind. And so Jesus says the word, same Greek word that means shut up to the wind and the wind stopped. And it's the exact same word in Greek that when the demons are in all of the pigs and everything that Jesus says stop and all the pigs go into the water. Shut up and go. And Jesus turns to Peter and all of the other disciples and says, you have realized I'm the Messiah, now shut up, don't tell anybody. And then he comes back and says, I need to die and I need to go on the cross and I need to suffer and these horrible, horrible things need to happen and people don't like to hear about horrible things. So then Peter comes back and he goes, wait, shut up. And as soon as he says that and says, no, we don't want that to happen to you, then Jesus comes back again and says, no, you shut up. This has to happen. Bad things happened to Jesus. Horrific things. The whole thing about being killed on a cross was the very worst thing that could be done to people where Jesus lived at the time. And it was drug out over a day. He was tried in front of everybody. He was stripped. His clothes were sold off. He was spit on. He was beaten. Horrible, horrible, horrific public things happened to him. But we try to pretend like that didn't happen because it makes us feel uncomfortable. It certainly makes me feel uncomfortable. I know even watching any of the, the movies that have a lot of blood and guts, I, I'll be honest with you. Th these are my three ways of dealing with it. The first one is like this or just looking at the top corner of the screen. The second one is sitting like this the whole time just listening. And the third one's just turning it off. Because I don't like to see that kind of stuff. And I certainly don't want to think about the person that I have dedicated my life to dying like that. There was a time, oh, it's been in the last three or four years, maybe even as many as five, that buying these big gaudy crosses was the thing and Macy's had one in their front window that went from shoulder to hip, kind of like a bandolero style and the cross sat at six inches tall and it was studded with all of these semi-precious stones and it was supposed to be this piece to go out and really show your faith, I guess, but it would be like walking around with a guillotine on your hip because it was a form of torture and a form of killing. We make dying on the cross not sound so bad.
But in fact, it was. It was pretty, pretty bad. So much so that Jesus had to go to the disciple he called the first and said, shut up what you're saying and listen to what I have to say. So this is what we believe in. And this is what we're told that we have to lose ourselves, lose our ego to follow. Is it something we really want to do and what does that mean? So this week, I put out a survey on Facebook. And I went into the Presbyterian clergy page and I said, give me two words of what it means to be Presbyterian. And I went to the ELCA clergy page and I put, give me two words of what it means to be Lutheran. Do you think they all agreed on everything? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Which is what is so interesting to me is because these are two faiths that we believe Yet, there were all of these different opinions as to what the words meant. And I will have to tell you, I had well over 50 people responding on both sides, which I thought was ex ex excellent. So, with the Presbyterians, two people said free will. Fifteen people said reformed and reforming, or trans and seven people said transformation. Eight said order, inspiration, and decent, which apparently is part of the creedal part of the first page of being Presbyterian. Six said committee meetings. <laughs> Two said the frozen chosen. Um, then there were some single ones, middle way, being church, rest in prayer, mutual, shared discernment, good scotch. I thought that one was a good one for Presbyterians to say. Um, Twelve said grace and gratitude. And I thought, okay, that's a good place for the Lutherans and the Presbyterians to join. Uh, two, inclusive loving. Three, faith and social justice. Six, decent and orderly out of 1 Corinthians. Um, there's a tulip doctrine. How many people know what that is, Presbyterians? Tulip doctrine. It's the five points, and it spells tulip, and it's what the Presbyterians believe. I'm open and compassionate. Two said shared leadership. Five said intelligent and spiritual. Then we had potluck and casserole. That came over on both sides, both Lutheran and Presbyterian. Responsibility and contrarian. Um, two said we're connected. Two said corporate sin. Robert's Rules, I kind of like that one, Christ-like, Go and Teach, Women Equality, Chaotic Order. I thought, oh, that's just about any religion at this point. Two said Elected Service, one said Yummy Bread, uh, Sinful and Graceful, two said Task Force, Connected Grace, Mission Focus, Lapsed Calvinist, and so there's quite a few of them that just had one thing, but, but that was the most part. I really thought it was kind of interesting to see all the formed and reformed and then all of the order and the structure and the meetings and, and that that's how Presbyterians themselves define themselves. So Lutherans came up. Lutherans, free and generous, and they had 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 30, oh, 52 graces. But they didn't just have grace. They had abundant grace, extravagant grace, proclaiming grace, grace alone, unconditional grace, boundless grace, grace space, abounding grace, acceptance, acceptable grace, inexhaustible grace, liberating grace, radical grace, inherited grace, amazing grace, underserved grace, abounded gra unbounded grace, real grace, saving grace, lavish grace, realistic, misunderstood grace. I never knew there were that many kinds of grace. <laughs> They had eight, saint and sinner, and that's a big thing in the Lutheran church. You're both and, saint and sinner. They had two for the Augsburg Confession, uh, two for Jesus Christ alone, 12 for unconditional love, and then love came up as unconditional, radical, incarnate, um, love always, foundational love, and forever love. 
Then they had Living Faith, had two, Justice and Serve, had two, Law and Gospel had two, Jesus's Grace had two, The World and Labor had two, Christ Suffered and Christ Faith had three, Word and Sacrament were two, For You were two, Two Kingdoms, Freedom and Deed were two, Constantly Reformed were two, Forgiven and Called, Free to Read Scripture. And so it was interesting to me as, as I read these, being able to see so clearly where the Lutherans and the Presbyterians have things in common with the wanting to serve, wanting to reform, wanting to be constantly changing, and wanting to be able to ask questions of what's going on and to have the, the questions answered. So, you know, I thought that is so Christ too, because Christ never answered a question unless Christ asked another question. So it just made sense to me that as a Christian, you would ask questions and expect them to, to be answered. So we know that Christ was blessed. Christ definitely was the child of God and beautiful and guilty and thankful and loved and strong and, and all of these other wonderful words. And the faiths that follow him are all of these things that both the Presbyterians and the Lutherans said. So what do we do with all of that? What do we do with the fact that Christ died on the cross a horrific death and what do we do with that Christ has good things and bad things associated with Christ and that all of us are this big mumble jump junk of good and bad? What we do is we sit with it and we accept it, that none of us are perfect and that none of us are horrible, that all of us are forgiven because of our faith, and because of grace and not because we did anything. And what we do with it is know that we are loved totally and completely. And that we take that love and we go out into service. So what I've got now for you to see is a video. And the video is, the guy is British, so it is a little bit hard initially to understand, but it doesn't take long to get into that where your ear can start hearing his cadence. But it talks about being a Christian and it talks about things that Christians do worldwide. And I'm hoping that in watching this, you will get something out of it. All right, whenever you're ready. Global enterprise that makes a difference in the world. And sometimes we get so caught up in our little world and we make it really small. But what we do in following Jesus and in saying that we are a Christ follower is we make a difference in people's lives all over this cosmos in places we will never go to, but they are touched by our prayers and they are touched by people that we touch, that touch another, that touch another, that make a difference. So that's why it was so important for Jesus to die that horrible, horrible death. Because if he had died just a regular death, it wouldn't have been so unbelievable. And it needed to be unbelievable for us to realize, A, our worth, and for us to realize what God was willing to give up just for little old me and little old you. So yeah, you're part of something much, much bigger than just this church here in Texas City. You are a part of being a child of God, and that is pretty, pretty amazing. So who do you say I am? A child of God making a difference in this great big world. And all God's people say, amen. amen.